Welcome to the Learning Reinvented podcast brought to you by myself, James Politilo. And Katie Godden from The Learning Effect. There are lots of learning podcasts out there, so we wanted to do something slightly different. This week, we wanted to focus on how you can develop great learning content without wasting lots of time and money. James, when we were talking about topics for this podcast, we started to talk about the challenges we often see clients struggle with, and this is one of the top ones. Yeah, absolutely, Katie. I think what you see is people are trying to transition across to new learning platforms or maybe from an old learning platform to a more modern one and they go about the process of selecting their platform and then they get to the stage of going okay so what are we going to put in it and it's a challenge if it's a new platform because they may not have anything at all and if it's an old platform suddenly they go okay it's like moving house a bit where you look at the stuff in your old house or your old learning system, you go, it's not quite going to fit or work in the new new house or the new learning platform. So at that point, people are stuck and they have a number of options out there. And often those options are quite expensive. So they can go and buy a license to something like LinkedIn Learning or other off the shelf content libraries, or they can go and spend thousands recommissioning uh, bespoke e-learning content or developing materials by getting external people to pay for it. But one of the things we like to talk about, and you know, certainly one of your passions is is how you can do that in a more effective way. So if someone is facing that situation, what should they be thinking about? Yeah, I think you're right. There's there's those options where you can go and purchase stuff, but there's actually lots of free content out there as well. Um, so we've got access to the internet, so you've got kind of YouTube, you've got lots of articles, so around particular topics, all, all you've got to do is kind of Google something and you'll find things. So especially when you've got kind of generic content that you're trying to push out to your organisation, um, that doesn't change between organisations. Uh, and one of the ones I like to highlight is kind of fire safety. Fire is not made any different in any different organisation. It's always the same way and we always teach the same things. But for some reason, we always seem to make kind of personalised content around that subject. Whereas if you looked on YouTube and places like that, you'd find really great free content and you can weave in uh, your policies around that to make it more personalised. So if you take that kind of bite sized chunk um, feel to your content, as opposed to kind of long 30 minute courses, you're able to do that a lot more easily and a lot cheaper. Yeah, I think there's lots of potential traps for people to fall into. So if we think over time, content really hasn't evolved. It's just transition from what was classroom content. So, you know, maybe you come along into a classroom and you've got to deliver to someone some learning. Now, I think if we all traveled to a classroom, went into a classroom and someone went, OK, here's what you need. It's taken two minutes. You can go now. Everyone would feel, well, why did you drag me out of the classroom, make me come here? So we started to fill up the days with, OK, let's give you lots of stuff in that in that training. So you then start to think about all the information that comes across. So, so go back to your, you know, your fire safety example. You know, people start telling people about the legislation that means that this is important. They start to over elaborate on the point. And if you actually strip back and go, what are we trying to tell people here? What's important for people to know? What don't they already know? What's the nuances or the particular things about the context they're working in that people should be aware of? What are the set policies or rules people need to follow? You start to narrow down a lot and focus in on what's really important for those people to to take away from any learning or interaction they have and suddenly it becomes a lot smaller. So if you have just bought a or had made in the past a, a 30 minute fire safety training video, for instance, you could go, actually, it's going to cost a, a, a bit of money to unthink how we put that training together. But think about it in a different way. If you were to able to encapsulate great takeaway learning in, in four or five minutes, just to the point, maybe some infographics or, you know, a short video, maybe, you know, one page on the policy or whatever it happens to be, but something that really pills out the points that is relevant to them. Not only have you allowed people to focus in on what's important and be able to pick through, you know, straight to the heart of what the matter is, rather than having to, to wait 30 minutes and go through lots of clicks or interactions to get there, 
what you've also done is save them 25 minutes of their time. And if you times that up by all the employees in your organization, it suddenly becomes very powerful. And also you're sending a better message out to people of, if you come for learning or development or support in our organization, we're not going to waste your time. Every minute and second is going to be valuable because we're really going to help you to understand what's critical to you. So I think there's so much more than just going, it's going to be difficult. Think about the cultural messages around learning. Think about the time you're saving people. So, you know, that that's how I would approach the challenge is always get back to what do people really need to know? And therefore that should drive your content strategy rather than just what's easy or what you've done in the past. On that one as well is working with the relevant teams so like if it's health and safety for example work with your health and safety team so you can actually pull out those key points of information i think that's sometimes where it becomes difficult where you have got something that's perhaps a 30 minute course and you're not quite sure which are the key points and which are the relevant bits of information you need to pull out so that then becomes difficult and it's easier just to kind of give everyone that really long course so you're kind of covering all bases but in reality uh, they only need to know kind of 10% of that information that you're supplying them and they're probably not going to remember all of it anyway <laughs> in reality so work with those key key teams within your organization and make sure you're able to pull that out because at the end of the day they're the subject matter experts in their field aren't they um you want as a learning professional you're you're there to kind of support and enable that uh, and get that delivery out right to to the population yeah, you're the bridge between the subject matter experts and those end learners and trying to make sure that you understand the needs of both of them and find the best way of of delivering between the two and joining those people up. You know, and I, th I think another example we were talking about quite recently was, say, um, HR training. And, you know, the, the person we were talking to had, was trying to replicate the traditional learning they had. And it was, you know, a half day course on discipline and grievance, a half day course on recruitment, a half day course on this. And you, you look at it and you, you know, your HR training for new managers is suddenly nearly a week long. And actually, if you unpick it and think about it in a different way, there is a lot of duplicated content across that. So, you, you know, at the core of it, HR skills are being able to interview, investigate, being able to build relationships, et cetera. So there's some some core soft skills in the middle of that. And then there are processes around the edges that people need to understand. And if you think about the processes, some of those processes you're going to be doing day in, day out. So you probably need to be able to do those in the same way that you can do any part of your job. So there's probably needs to be detailed training for everyone. Other parts of those processes only come later on down the line, you know, or only occur once every so often. So it might be discipline and grievances in a particular organisation do not occur very often. So therefore you don't need to train everyone in the discipline and grievance process and how to run a disciplinary hearing or how to hold an appeal. What people need is awareness of those processes and awareness of what they need to be doing to prevent those processes from occurring because you don't really want to end up in discipline and grievance. So, or when it is appropriate to enact a discipline or grievance process. So your change and focus on the learning makes it far more targeted. And then if someone does need to be involved in a discipline and grievance hearing, you can change your approach. And again, if you think about the past, when the only way we could deliver learning was in classroom based training or face to face contact, you might go, actually, we need to put it all in and we need to get everyone to know it, because if someone does have uh, a discipline or grievance they need to work through, they can't wait five weeks for a training course or they can't wait for this. Well, actually, because of the tools and the systems we've got now, if someone does need to go through that, it's the same as if you break down on the motorway and you need to change your wheel. You can actually Google the answer. You can see how to change the wheel on your tire. If you need to do something at home that you don't do very often, again, you go to Google. So why not have the same things at work? Because you're aware in that situation, I need to change the tire. So again, in, for work situation, I'm aware that I need to go through a disciplinary process. I'm aware of that. I'm aware there's some steps and rules I follow. So create that experience where it's easy for that person in that situation to take the time out to go, 
okay, I've got some really targeted material here that's going to help me on this. And maybe someone in my local area I can I can talk to as well and get support from. But again, you completely flip the way that you're providing learning because it's there designed to be helpful to the person in the moment, not overload them with knowledge and content at a time where they probably don't have relevance for that content. And again, one of the things I found in my career is so often people won't go through all those bits of mandatory training because they don't have the time and they don't see the relevance. And that's where you lose people along the journey. I think one of the key points, especially from like what you've just said, um, is that we're not creating training for kind of a one time purpose. So it isn't just like that one course, whereas previously before kind of online training existed, you probably would have that a lot more because you were only able to go to a workshop or you might have a, a some some literature to read or something like that but we've got we've got the tools to be able to completely change that and you are you're creating learning so it, it can be used again and again and like you said if it, if it's the things that you're not doing on a daily basis you're not going to remember those but you need to have something that's quick and easy to come back to and reference and easy to find as opposed to sitting through an hour's worth of content to find that that five bit of a five minute bit of information that you do actually need and i think that they're the bits that we kind of forget about probably as learning designers sometimes we can go into kind of creating everything with bells and whistles because it looks cool but is it actually particularly useful i think again it's been far more pragmatic in your approach to learning because there is a traditional view that you need to you know provide lots of models and theories and things like that Whereas if you break it down, think about, you know, I, I actually need something to enhance my questioning skills or I've got some great core questioning skills, but what are the particular questions I should be asking in an interview situation or I should be probing in a developmental review with my team or in a disciplinary review or I, yeah, I've got to carry out an investigation. What should I be approaching there? So some really honed in targeted suggestions that are about that context are far more helpful than a sort of model that's detached from reality you might want to put mm -hmm. some of those into your core skills so you might say actually being understanding questioning at a level is a core skill for people in our business we do that we help you understand that but then you don't need to revisit that you know in the model go through it give them the theory you just need to be actually pragmatically in the moment what do i need at this point what type of questions yeah. are helpful and why what's that question tried to elicit what's the point of it how does that fit into the rhythm or the purpose of the activities i'm, I'm carrying out and it starts to strip around away and make your learning far more relevant and contextual. So we've kind of talked about the, the types of content and creating that content. So whether you're buying um, off the shelf content and as opposed to doing that, curating and creating your own content. But there are also lots of free or cheap tools that you can use to actually create that content yourself as well. So your phone is probably one of the most valuable bits that you can use. Um, everyone or most people now have access to a smartphone and so you can create video content. You've got thing, you've got different apps on there that you're able to then edit that video. You've got auto cues that you can use from your phone. Um, you've got things like Canva, which are really great. So that that kind of enables you to be a bit of a graphic designer. Um, and again, they can be free or, or really cheap per month to actually run and use, but it can enhance all your pieces of content. So like one pages, um, any PowerPoints that you might be putting on there as reference, um, kind of headers and footers um, to your videos, etc. as well. So um, it's thinking outside the box, I think, when it comes to making these things. We don't have to go through the, the really expensive tools that kind of like the learning industry uses and everyone's familiar with in the learning industry. There are a lot of things out there now that, that can be used and can create really great content. And I think it all comes back to that point of purpose and what you're trying to achieve with content, because often in the past, one of the blocks to using some of those tools like user generated video or an infographic put together by the learning team in Canva or even one of your subject matter experts is, OK, this is really about brand and marketing and it needs to look perfect and we need to make sure that this is you know, polished and has been through several rounds of editing or approval um and that's just really slow and it's not how we work in in the current world so it is it's spinning it down and starting to think to yourself 
when is content something that needs a huge amount of investment and time and putting in and maybe you have some hero bits of content that are there forever they're part of setting that brand expectation for your business and maybe that is worth investing in you know either spending time if you've got your own videographer or an external videographer or whatever else to bring through that pattern and emotion because that's key that's that's a real key message to people in your business but it might be on something else you go well we don't need to do that on every single bit of content because actually something else someone working in canva to put an infographic with the top 10 tips as to how we approach customers here is going to be far more useful and helpful to your people rather than going here's a 30 minute very well put together e-learning program on you know approaching customer service so it's thinking in different ways as to how you put those things together and there's lots of models and tools out there that get you to think about your content how it's structured how long it is how many people it's for because if you're trying to get value out of what you're spending you need to think about okay how critical is this bit of content how long is that content going to be relevant for is it across the whole organization is it for a small subsection and some of those thought processes will help you narrow down and decide where you need to put your time and effort into content development yeah definitely and i think you've kind of highlighted there as well where you said uh, the customer service team using their top 10 tips they're probably using that anyway it's just in a different format they probably just got bullet points attached to their laptop or it's sent around in an email so why don't you pull those bits out and put it in something that is like Canva um, and actually, actually make it more accessible so people aren't having to kind of send that round via email etc and it's, it's more accessible to then everyone and no one's missed out on that and instead of focusing on what things should look like and and making sure that they're so specific to a brand when in reality that isn't actually the important bit the important bit is the the top 10 tips that you're trying to get out yeah and I think it's you know any of those ways of sharing best practice within your team or sharing context because you can go buy a content library and it will have hundreds of courses on there you know with everything from DNI to project management etc and some of those can be really useful but what the, the point you do is take those bits of useful generic content and wrap your individual localized context around it. So it doesn't have to be a project management course where you go out to a, an e-learning company or even get your own you know, development team to put something together in, in Articulate or whatever people will be using and creating a whole e-learning program around something from scratch. And like, well, actually we could have got that generic content from there and we could have just spent a little bit of time putting our context around it would have as good stuff and we can probably done four programs for the cost and time of where we've done one so again it's taking a different approach to how you look at those things how localized every bit of that journey needs to be and where you add context and localization because if you were to go and speak to that customer service team draw out all of the lessons they've learned and put something back that can be shared with new joiners that's probably far more powerful than you know going and, and trying to create some perfect program from scratch yeah definitely and i think um you kind of briefly touched on it before the world that we live in now everything's so much more fast paced and we, we don't know what's going to happen in the future and things can change overnight literally um so you can't spend three four months building a program because that that may change so we do need to speed up that process and i think kind of understand what we value most uh, and get the most out of what we're trying to achieve as opposed to kind of taking um months to to create something that's only going to be valuable for a short amount of time as well sometimes and i think it's about pushing back as well because if you think about what you're trying to achieve so if we go back to the fire safety example if we're trying to prevent fires occurring in the workplace then you should you know learning going on a you know click 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 e-learning course you know people get bored through those things we've seen and again we've seen some terrible examples where people have just tried to make them really interesting and add animations and lots of bells and whistles to something that doesn't need it in effect what you should be doing is stripping back but going in and working with your teams and with your subject matter experts and the people in your business to go what are we actually doing to manage risk in this business so you know mm -hmm. are we flagging risk properly 
are and you know you said before about learning being a one-off learning isn't a one-off you can actually communicate to people regularly so what are you doing to get to communicate to people risks in similar environments or near misses at work or incidents or whatever so that you've got a sensible drumbeat of reinforcing those messages all the time so your environment becomes a safe one rather than an environment that just does health and safety training on a once a year tick box exercise you're actually building it into the way you work the way you communicate and it's a different approach but ultimately you might not be able to show as many hours that people have done e-learning what you should be able to show is that the amount of incidents reported back by your team is higher because actually they they know what they're looking for and therefore you've removed some of those risks because you're actually having an impact on a safer workplace. So it's thinking about that end goal. Is it clicks in a learning program? Is it ticks? Is it a compliance report? Or is it ultimately having a safe system of work or a learning and development system that produces people are able to perform in their roles? So enhance customer service rather than 50 people having gone through the customer service course. So it's moving those metrics back into the metrics that are relevant to the workplace, not just the learning metrics you can measure. And I think where you've got kind of content that exists already, so you might have kind of workshops, face to face events, etc. that you've already got loads of content for. It's just important to remember not just to whack that online, um, although that's the, the easy way to do it. If you've got tons of PowerPoints, it's just to put them online and let people work their way through it. That's that's really unengaging and that's something that's not going to help with anything that you kind of just mentioned or or the other points that we've mentioned previously as well is is making sure you're using that kind of curation, create those free tools, those cheap tools out there and actually transforming that into something that's really engaging and useful for the population while keeping the purpose there as well because there are things that you're not going to be able to do that you were able to do in an online situation um so you you can't they don't just transition into into online it doesn't translate like that and i think that's probably where people have become unstuck from the last year or so um having lots of face-to-face -face events go online and we've kind of heard about like zoom fatigue and things like that um and now i think is the point where we can start unpicking some of that and, and making sure we're getting really great online content out there as well yeah and I, I think it's it's not easy to do to suddenly make that shift you know it is far easier to go i'll buy an online content library and i'll outsource this to here and we'll just flip over this and we'll upload some some powerpoints that's easy whether it's impactful. In theory, easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In theory, it's easy, but you, you know, you can do that. And if your expectations are low and people have, you know, have, have start off with their online learning is not very good learning or it's something I have to endure rather than is helpful, then, you know, you're, it's probably relatively easy to do that and, and almost get away with it. But if you if you roll back and say, we're now at a point where the last year and a half has given us that opportunity to say, how should learning look differently? When should we be using online? When should we bring people together? And when I say bring people together, that is either in face to face or it could be on a Zoom call or in a virtual classroom or even in a collaborative space online or a chat forum, whatever it is. But thinking about intentionally, when is that the right thing to do? Because we're sharing best practice, we're building community, we're trying to innovate, we're trying to build on ideas. Whereas before we just brought people together because it was the only way of getting them away from their desks having a nice lunch and, and doing things, or it was the only way that we had as a tool to be able to innovate and create. But now we have so many more tools that actually it's a thinking about being very purposeful and structured around what's this event, what's this bit of learning, what's this bit of content there to do, and is it going to help that end user achieve their goal rather than just achieve our goal of running some training around that topic. Yeah, and I think like, we've kind of briefly mentioned it as well, where where people perhaps aren't sure of what to do and what the approach is or how to do that. And I think I think one of the things that we've seen as well is is get experts in. If you aren't sure what to do, 
um, ask for help and, and look, look in the right places for that help as well. Don't just kind of sit and struggle because if you sit and struggle, you're just going to end up kind of recreating the same type of content over and over again. And and kind of like those levels of engagement that you really want out of your content, whether it's a workshop online, whatever, you're not going to see that because you're, you're kind of recreating the same stuff all the time. Yeah, and I think if anyone sat there wondering about where they start or or what are the things they can do and keep in just understanding where you spend your money at the moment. You know where all of your program money is going where have you got a you know an online content library that very few people use that so you can start to identify some savings or you know again members of your team who are currently taking ages to put together stuff or you're having to go externally to produce quite simple bits of content that maybe if you took some time to have a go on a, a, a free tool such as Canva or one of the animation tools that are relatively free or uh, low cost. You know, these can give you an opportunity to start testing out and maybe don't start with your most critical bit of business learning because therefore you're putting yourself up on a pedestal. Everyone will throw stones at you, but maybe start with something small. Build your own confidence, build your expertise, work with people in your business who may be more open to change and you can start to create an opportunity for people to see that there is a different way of doing things and it doesn't have to be big bang you can evolve your content over time but eventually what you'll start to see is people going why well, have I got to do this this over here which feels quite outdated and doesn't feel very targeted when you've got some great stuff there and that's the point where you can start talking to your business and saying to them we might need to change or think about our focus on this. We might need to change and focus on our investment in this or, or change how we think about developing learning. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Learning Reinvented podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. If you've not already done so, please follow our podcast. And if the learning effect can help you and your organisation, please do get in touch. You can find both James and Katie on LinkedIn and our contact details are in the show notes below.